presentation of our webinars does not constitute endorsement or medical advice. Appropriate medical advice should always be sought from your own healthcare professionals. Today, we're delighted to have with us Jason Fung, physician, author, and researcher, whose groundbreaking science-based books about diabetes and obesity, The Diabetes Code, The Obesity Code, and The Complete Guide to Fasting, have sold over a million copies. And Eve Mayer, who's a speaker, author, and entrepreneur recognized by Forbes as one of the most influential women in social media, as, and also as one of the eight women to follow on Twitter by CNN. And Megan Ramos is a clinical educator. She joined Dr. Fung and his colleagues as a research student with a keen interest in preventative medicine when she was just 15 years old and has since become a leading expert on therapeutic fasting and low carbohydrate diets. So I'm going to step off and turn it over to them and they'll be talking about their new book, Life in the Fasting Lane. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here and thank you to everyone who's joining us. Hello everybody, thanks so much. My name is Eve Mayer and I think the way that we'll kick this off is we'll each take turns telling you a little bit about us. I'm gonna start with Dr. Jason Fung because I'm gonna bet that a lot of you may know <laughs> who he is, but I'd love for Jason to just tell you a little bit about what kind of doctor he is and how he started down this path. Jason? Thanks Eve. Um, so I'm a kidney specialist, so I train at UCLA and the University of Toronto. And uh, basically I got very interested in this because of uh, type two diabetes, which is one of the leading causes of kidney failure. So that's really what I'm interested in uh, professionally. And it fairly became fairly clear that uh, people who lose weight do a lot better with their type two diabetes. And if you do better with your type two diabetes, then you'll have less diabetic kidney disease. So that's where I really started getting interested in the question of what causes weight gain, what causes weight loss. Um, and it was, um, I was a little bit uh, surprised uh, to see that a lot of the stuff that I had sort of been taught and was sort of considered um, sort of gospel uh, in terms of nutrition and weight loss was, as I saw it, quite incorrect and not useful to most people trying to lose weight. And that's where I started uh, talking about it. And that's where some of my other books were talking about the, di uh, the obesity code, the diabetes code. And then I uh, sort of uh, started using intermittent fasting in my clinic uh, very heavily because that is, the, um, that is the sort of approach that made the most sense for me from a scientific standpoint. And, um, you know, really had a lot of success. Like people were having very, very dramatic losses in their weight and their diabetes was getting a lot better. And it wasn't as bad as most people feared it was. So that's where I became very interested in the use of fasting to, to, to give people options for their weight loss. Thank you so much, Jay Jason. Now I'd like to introduce researcher and also Jason's business partner, Megan Ramos. Megan, can you tell us a bit about yourself and all the impressive things about you that I already know? <laughs> Thanks, Eve. Uh, I, I started out at a young age being interested in medical research and uh, disease prevention. My mom was really sick while I was growing up. And that's sort of what led me to do research in nephrology. Um, but at the same time, uh, my career and my personal lives sort of crossed paths because I grew up eating garbage processed and refined foods, being told to eat all day long, being encouraged to eat all these snacks all the time. And at a young age, my dietary habits caught up with my health. I had fatty liver disease. I was diagnosed when I was 12. I had poly polycystic ovarian syndrome. I was diagnosed when I was 14. And then in my mid-20s, I was working in the nephrology department, and all I saw were these patients becoming more and more sick. And the research study I was working on was literally monitoring the progression of their decline. It was really depressing. 
and heartbreaking. So I gave myself this pep talk, okay, Megan, you've got to follow the Canadian food guide and you've got to, you know, make sure that you're stabilizing your blood sugar levels all day long and, and take this really seriously. And in a short period of time, I gained close to 80 pounds and I developed type two diabetes. I was just fortunate because at the same time, Jason was already talking to his patients about fasting and about low carbohydrate diets. So I heard, uh, the information flowing around the clinic and I decided to give it a shot myself. And within six months, I lost over 60 pounds. I normalized my blood sugar levels and was no longer a diabetic. I had no more fatty liver disease or PCOS. So I started working with Jason so we could bring this to our office patients. After his book, uh, The Obesity Code came out, we had a lot of requests from people all over the world to learn about fasting. So we started an online program where we uh, have an online do-it-yourself education on fasting and eating and where we do online coaching. So you don't have to be in Toronto to come and see us in our clinic. We're trying to make this information accessible to everybody. Thank you so much, Megan, and I'll round this out. My name is Eve Mayer. Um, I am not a doctor, I am not a researcher, I am not a scientist, I'm just a regular chick. So the way I want you to treat me is, I'm like your best friend who doesn't have a filter and is often inappropriate. So that's where I'm coming to you from. Any question that you feel uncomfortable about or feel silly about, let me know. My background is I'm an entrepreneur, a mom, a wife. I was very successful in life at just about everything except for my health and my weight. I peaked at 300 pounds. I was morbidly obese for 24 years. I had PCOS and fertility issues, pre-diabetes, bronchitis, pneumonia, recurring upper respiratory issues, and just thought I had a bad immune system. Now that I've used fasting and low carb for over two years, I've gotten to the healthiest weight of my life, which is between 185 and 195 pounds, quite an improvement over 300. And I'm off of all daily medications and I'm much, much healthier. I had three bariatric surgeries, tried every diet, tried every exercise, tried every therapy. And for me, the answer was low carb and intermittent fasting. When I discovered this after 24 years, having never heard this information before, because I read The Obesity Code by Dr. Fung, I reached out to him and he was crazy enough to talk to me. And both he and Megan were kind enough to let me come out to Toronto and meet with them. And we formed a plan two years ago to create a book that we felt like was none other. The reason for the book, Life in the Fasting Lane, is that it offers three perspectives. A doctor who has medical research in fasting, a researcher who has treated thousands of people in improving their health and their weight with fasting, and a person who failed in every single way until she found fasting. We're not here to say that fasting is the answer for everyone, but we're here to say that fasting is information that needs to be accessible to everyone, because whether you're trying to lose three pounds or 300 pounds, or you're just trying to improve your health, Fasting is something that everyone in this world can afford because it's zero dollars and they can consider it as an option for possibly looking at improving their health. So that's our scoop. Um, the first uh, question we have here is Camilla. Camilla says, beautiful book. Here is our book, Life in the Fasting Lane. I agree it is beautiful, Camilla. <laughs> and I will send this first question over to Megan. She says, I wonder if, if it's safe to fast for two three weeks on your own, or do I need to see a doctor? I have no known illnesses, but very high BMI. And I'll just say this, just so you guys know, since we have so many questions and you're incredible, we're gonna try to limit our answers to probably around one minute each if we can. So Megan, this one's for you. We've worked with a lot of people who have tried fasting for two to three weeks for weight loss, but I do think it's important to work with your healthcare provider. That is a long time to fast, and you just want to make sure that your blood pressure uh, stays stable during the fast and that your blood, uh, blood test results, your, your lab work is being monitored during extended fasting. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dr. Fung, this next one is for you. Um, it is from Casey, and she would like to tell you, thank you, Dr. Fung, for giving me my life back. I am down 80 pounds, about 30 to go, never been happier, energy levels through the roof, sex drive is back, I like that, Casey, 
gray hair gone and happier than I've ever been. Now, now, Dr. Fung, here, here's my gray <laughs> hair. And my question is, why is Casey uh, really having less gray hair, but I still have my gray hair? Does, does fasting actually affect gray hair? <laughs> Um, I don't know if there's any studies on that. Um, so it's difficult because the thing is that um, it's possible. It's possible. There's lots of different things that happen in the body. And there's all these uh, things like autophagy, which people talk about as a mechanism of wellness. That is to say, this is a, a process where your sort of body is getting rid of the old um, cells and subcellular parts, and maybe that has something to do with it. But truly, nobody really knows what causes gray hair in the first place. So it's hard to know if it's going to help. Uh, it'd be great if it, if it was uh, consistent, but uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I, I guess it's one of these things that, hey, it's great if it happens. There's all these other things, all these other great things that happen. But, uh, it, you know, if it works for gray hair, that'd be amazing. Casey, I just we're, don't know the answer. Casey, we're <laughs> super happy for you, and I'm completely jealous. All right. Um, people are asking, do we ask about the book or health? Guys, you can ask us about whatever you would like, and we will do our best to answer the question. When will the book be available in South Africa? Um, I don't know that answer. I do know that it's available in the UK right now, New Zealand, Australia, US, and Canada, and it's coming in many different languages and countries in Spanish, Portuguese, Korean, French, and German are the languages I know that it's coming out, but we expect it to be available in more and more areas. Okay, uh, this next one's for Megan. How do you know when it's more important to feed your body rather than fast? I think your, your body will let you know if you're feeling tired, if you're feeling fatigued, if you're craving protein or craving some fat, then you should probably listen to your body. And of course, if you're not feeling well for any reason, there's no, uh, there's no need to push the fast. You can simply have a meal or, or eat for a few days and then try to fast again if you're feeling up for it. So some weeks fasting is just more difficult for others. Maybe sleep, maybe stress are interfering. And during those times, eating and just being mindful not to snack and stick to your meal times might be more beneficial. And then when you're filling up for it, getting into a fast would be great. Thank you, Megan. Okay, Dr. Fung, uh, Alejandro would like to know, what are your thoughts on protein modified fast? And just for me, what is a protein modified fast? Because I don't know what that is. Well, there's nothing specific about it. I mean, you have to understand that a lot of the, uh, so protein modified fast is, there, there's no specific um, set definition for that. Some people like to take uh, exogenous protein like uh, whey protein or some of these protein powders or protein bars or whatever um, and they're all variations of fast so fasting technically is really nothing but water water only fast is technically what it is but depending on what you want to do there's all kinds of ways you can modify that fast and still get the benefits but you have to understand what you're doing so if, for example, your goal is to, uh, you know, lose weight, then yeah, certainly protein modified fats may be very beneficial for you. There's all different studies on, say, different fasting regimens like the five to two, which is again not a strict fast. There's people who do fat fasting. There's people who do all kinds of, you know, uh, they allow this during the fast or that during the fast. Bone broth, for example, is a popular one. Those are all variations, and you can do very well. So, uh, but there are other you know, times where you may not do so well. So if you're trying to activate, say, autophagy, which we talked about, which is hard to define because it's very hard to measure, then uh, a protein is going to turn off the autophagy. So you're not going to do well turning on autophagy if you're taking a protein, uh, you know, taking protein during the fast. So it all depends on what your goal is. If you're trying to control blood sugars, for example, that may do very well. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, it may do very well. So depending on what you're trying to do with that, uh, you can certainly use those variations and there's no problems with that. As Jason just mentioned fat fasting, which was something foreign to me I had never heard of. And I think you should check out 
Um, it's a way to get back on track if maybe you've kind of fallen off the wagon with a bit with the way you've been eating. And I think Megan has a really great piece on their blog at thefastingmethod.com. So check out thefastingmethod.com and look for the Fat Fasting blog. Megan, this comes from Lisa H. She says, is the idea to vary the fasting times to somehow trick the body? For example, 12 hours, 24 hours, eight hours, et cetera. Always great to change it up uh, because yes, you, you do sort of keep the body guessing and the body doesn't adapt to what you're doing. A lot of people reach out to me and ask how they can change it up because they've read so many testimonials of that being the, the true reason behind someone's success through fasting. And usually life changes it up for you. Some weeks you might be able to fast more than others because uh, you don't have as many social commitments, whereas other weeks there might be holidays or other celebrations and you might be eating more. So it all really balances itself out. So I think if you just try to plan the week ahead, look at what your schedule is like and see what kind of fasting you can fit in that week. Uh, if you just do that and, uh, from week to week, you'll reach, uh, you'll reach your health goals. Perfect. Dr. Fung, Alexa says, I'm officially in ketosis by following a low carb diet, keto diet and fasting 36 hours, two to three times a week. Is it true that if I indulge in a couple glasses of wine or in a piece of cake that it will kick me out of ketosis? It certainly could. Um, so ketosis is when your body is eating very low levels of carbohydrates. So you, fasting, of course, you're not eating anything, but you could eat a ketogenic diet, which is very, very low in carbohydrates. So during that period of time, your body is generating its energy from fat metabolism. And one of the byproducts is uh, ketone bodies, which is why people call it ketosis. If you um, just have a little bit of wine or a little bit of uh, cake, for example, then you're, it may be a very temporary blip and the ketosis may start right back up. If it's a big piece of cake or a lot of wine, then you may that may be enough to switch into carbohydrate metabolism. There's nothing wrong with that. Your body can use either carbohydrates or fat as a metabolic fuel, but you know if you're trying to stay in a ketogenic state, which is fat metabolism, then yeah, any significant amount of carbohydrate and alcohol is going to be metabolized very much, very, very similar to sugar, uh, is going to put you back into carbohydrate metabolism and then your body will stop making ketones. So yeah, certainly it could. It it's all depends on the person. So different people get into it and out of it at different rates. And also it depends on how much, how big that slice of cake is. Makes sense. Megan, will taking, from Kim Chase, will taking supplements cause you to break your fast? No, uh, it, uh, it, they won't. Sometimes supplements need to be taken with a little bit of fat or a little bit of food in order to be effective within the body. So that's just something to be mindful of when choosing whether or not to take a supplement during your fast. But if taking a supplement such as a multivitamin makes you, makes you feel better and feel more confident going into your fast, then that's absolutely fine to do. Thank you. Dr. Fung, Chetna says she had, or they have tried 42 hour fasting, but at the end of 36 hours, they usually start feeling very cold. Is it a sign of decreased metabolism? And what can I do to prevent decreased metabolism from fasting? Yeah, it can certainly happen. So uh, if your body isn't getting, going into sort of fat metabolism very quickly, then yeah, your body can sort of slow down the metabolic rate. So there's different things you can do. You can try to get your body and, and, and you know, we can measure this sometimes with something called the glucose ketone index, which is sort of what's happening with your glucose and what's happening with your ketone. So as your glucose falls, your ketones should rise. But in some people, when your glucose falls, your ketones don't rise, which means that you don't have any, you're not metabolizing carbohydrates and you're not getting yet into fat metabolism because that's where a lot of energy is generated from. So if you uh, have that situation, then your body really doesn't have a lot of fuel to metabolize and therefore it's going to have to slow itself down, which means that you're feeling cold. And this, there's, uh, you know, so it happens sometimes. Uh, there are several ways to do this. One is just to sort of try to get through it. Something like fat, uh, like a ketogenic diet is sometimes very helpful to get you into the, the, the sort of ketogenic state before you do the fasting. 
makes it a lot easier. Uh, the other thing you could do is try just giving it some time. Over time, your body should get more and more used to fat metabolism and therefore switch in and out a lot easier. Or something like fat fasting, which is like a ketogenic diet, sort of like an extreme sort of uh, ketogenic diet. Um, or you go with shorter fasts more frequently. So there's nothing wrong if you're getting good results with the shorter fast. There's no, there's no reason that you would necessarily need to push it unless you really wanted to. So the other thing sometimes that's useful is doing a longer fast. Um, sort of really push your body so that it kind of gets through that uh, 36 hours and see what happens. And then a lot of times, once you get used to the longer fast and the shorter fast, are no problem. So there's all different things you can do, but everybody's different. So you really have to sort of experiment with these sort of options to, uh, to see what works best for you. Dr. Fung, Julie says, thank you so much for this webinar. She is a 64 year old woman, woman and she's heard that a 1410 intermittent fast is recommended for her age. She'd like to know your thoughts on that. I don't have any specific recommendations for any age, truthfully. Um, people can go as long as they feel well and they're doing well. So there's no specific medical reason why somebody who is older or younger can, can't go longer than 14 hours, for example. Um, our bodies can handle it, basically. Uh, you know, the, the whole problem <laughs> with a lot of modern medicine is that we think that the human body is so stupid that you can't <laughs> handle anything uh, that is, even though we are carrying sort of like two, three hundred thousand calories of body fat, we have to keep stuffing muffins in our mouth every two hours to stay alive. It's like, why would that make sense? Like, if you go longer than 14 hours um, and you are not sort of emaciated or assuming you have a reasonable level of body fat, then your body should really switch and use body fat. So as soon as you stop eating after the, you know, 14, at 14 hours, if you keep going, your body should be able to metabolize the body fat. That is, in fact, the sole reason you're carrying body fat. It's a store of food energy. So this is a time you need to use it. Sort of like if you store firewood for the winter. And it's not like if you need it, you don't go chop up your sofa and throw it in the fire because that's exactly why you're storing firewood. So our body stores calories in the form of body fat. That's why we have it and that's why you can use it. So if you have adequate body fat stores, then your body will be able to handle it. Now, if you're on medications, for example, then yeah, you have to make some adjustments because um, that's a specific situation. But otherwise, there's no reason why an otherwise healthy person of any age couldn't go longer than 14 hours or even 16 hours or 20 hours or 24 hours or whatever uh, because the, the, the stores of calories are there, right? You say you need 2,000 calories for the day and you're carrying 200,000 calories. Well, what's the big deal? you know, for the body, it shouldn't be a big deal. That is, in fact, the only reason we survived as a species, because there were periodic droughts, there were periodic famines. If we had to stuff muffins in our mouth every two hours, none of us would be here, right? This would be like Planet of the Apes kind of thing, right? We have that ability to use it. So what we're doing is we're using the body fat for what it is designed for, <laughs> So yeah, don't worry about going over 14 hours. I mean, you obviously have to look at your own situations. If you feel really, really bad after 14 hours, yeah, then maybe you shouldn't push it. But if you're feeling okay, there's no reason why you couldn't. Perfect. Megan, this is from Casey. She says, I have PCOS and while I have been very unsuccessful in losing weight, 80 pounds, my doctor is hesitant to take me off metformin for fears I will relapse and gain weight back and get frustrated. I did manage to drop from 1500 milligrams to 700 to 750 milligrams. Should I push for a time frame with my doctor on going off of it completely? I think it's always really important to work with your doctor and we don't know all of the factors or your entire medical history, 
But we have seen intermittent fasting be a really great treatment for polycystic ovarian syndrome. One of our coaches, Nadia, we call her the baby whisperer on our team because uh, she starts working with coaching members uh, in our program and they're seeking out weight loss and help for PCOS with fertility. And we've had over 30, 30 babies born to her clients since she started working with us. So fasting is a great treatment for PCOS. Jason and Nadia actually just wrote a book called The PCOS Plan, which became available last week and is targeted specifically at utilizing fasting and uh, lowering insulin levels to help uh, improve symptoms of PCOS. I was actually looking behind me because I was just reading it. And I <laughs> but yeah, she also should check that book out. Uh, Nadia and, and, and Jason's book on PCS specifically discusses this and it's really smart. Okay, so next we have uh, from Hillary. Is it okay to stick with short fasts under a day or is the real benefit with over a day days? Thanks. I'm going to answer this one. Um, you can check me out at fastinglane.com. And you can specifically look at three-day fast and 10-day fast where Megan guided me through these longer fasts and, and we, we broke the whole system down. So Hillary, I think the right fast is the fast that you can do. And if a short fast under a day is what you can start with, then that is perfect. I am all about doing the least amount of work that you can to reach whatever your health and fitness goals are. Um, I like to ask you to be easy on yourself and lazier. I'm your best friend, right? I'm not the doctor. So I think a lot of people out there could benefit from going from eating 10 times a day to eating eight times a day. I think a lot of people could benefit out there from going to eating six times a day to starting to eat three times a day. So yes, there are benefits from fasting, but if a short fast is what you can do, start with that and continue to push yourself forward until you reach your goals. And then if you reach your goals, for me, if I reach my health goals, then, then that's where I, I stick with. All right, next we have Karen who says, how safe is fasting during the COVID-19 outbreak? I'm gonna give this to this one to Megan. How, fast, how safe is fasting during the COVID-19 outbreak? Should we be following or avoiding certain fasting schedules during this time? I. <laughs> I think that there's there's no real information out there that shows where the fasting is beneficial or contradictory right now for the COVID situation. So it's just sort of best to assume that it's probably neutral and stick to whatever fasting plan is working for you. I know a lot of our fasting community right now, they're at home, they're not used to being at home, their work schedules have changed, they're trying to work and educate you know, three or four kids now at home and be their teachers too. So it's just really about finding what is working in your situation and that what you can do on a consistent basis and sticking with that routine. I'd like to add on to that as a regular person. I think that most people are experiencing some kind of stress right now during the pandemic, either at a high level or a low level. Perhaps you know someone sick, perhaps you're simply concerned, perhaps you have new financial concerns. This is a very stressful time. And for me personally, when I'm stressed, it's more difficult for me to pass. So I simply do what I can do. I do the best that I can and I'm kind to myself and I don't push myself to these new heroic limits um, at a time that I'm already stressed. So be sweet to yourself, please. And that enables you to be sweet to your family and you have to live with them. So, you know, there's that. All right, this next question is for Dr. Fung. Uh, it says, how safe is intermittent fasting for type two diabetics? Any suggestions? And I just wanna add, I bought my mom the uh, Dr. Fung's book, The Diabetes Code, which I highly recommend. So Jason, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for type two diabetes, it's, um, first of all, if you're on medications, then you absolutely have to talk to your doctor before you change your diet in any way. So if you're um, on medications, those medications are prescribed for you based on your current diet. So if you change that diet, for example, you see many people who switch to a very low carbohydrate diet, not fasting, but very low carbohydrate diet, for example, and their sugars get much, much better. So when they stay on their same dose of medication, then it's too much and they become 
hypoglycemic, which is dangerous. So you do always have to talk to your doctor when you're changing your diet in any way. And fasting is just one of the, the ways that you can do to make it better. So people have this, and this has been perpetuated for years, that you shouldn't fast if you're a type 2 diabetic, which is, of course, um, not true. It's really based on the fact that you shouldn't you know, not med monitor your medications and fast because that could get you in a very dangerous situation. But the fasting itself is very simple to understand. So type 2 diabetes is a disease where you have too much sugar in your body. Then it comes out, it spills out into the blood. So you measure the sugar in the blood and it's high. That's, that's really all that it is. But your body has too much sugar, then the answer is let your body use it up. So if you don't eat, your body will use up the sugar. And therefore, then you don't need as much medication to bring down your blood sugars. So we know this because everybody knows that if you don't eat, your blood sugars drop. Well, that makes sense. So if your blood sugars are going to drop with fasting, why don't you use fasting instead of taking a big whack of medication or insulin, for example? If you fast on a consistent basis, then your body will use up the sugar. Pretty soon, your body's not going to have too much sugar, and you can reverse your type 2 diabetes. And that's the whole point. So if you can reverse your type 2 diabetes, then you're going to reduce your risk of all kinds of other diseases, heart disease, kidney disease, strokes, cancer, all kinds of seriously bad diseases. And you can do it with an intervention that is free, that has been used for thousands of years, that works because, hey, who's going to, who's, if you don't eat, are you going to lose weight? Well, it's almost impossible for you not to lose weight if you're not eating. So the point is that it's going to work and anybody can do it. It's available to anybody in the world literally today. So anybody can do it and it's free and it can make you a lot better. Hey, what could be better than that? Uh, I'm not sure there is anything better than that. But you always have to be careful because when you're dealing with a medical condition or you're on medications for a medical condition, it, it pays to be safe. That is, make sure you're being monitored, make sure you're talking to a doctor that is going to support you with what you're doing. If they're not willing to support you, then you either have to stop or you have to get a different doctor uh, who is willing to support you because the sort of number one rule of fasting is you always have to be safe. Like, you can get into serious trouble with anything, and that's why you need to talk to your doctor. But uh, we've written a couple of uh, case uh, series on people, for example, this was a couple, uh, about a year ago, we published a case series where we had uh, three people who had been uh, type 2 diabetic for about 25 years on high doses of insulin, and we started them on some a fasting regimen, and they came off their insulin, like all three of them in less than a month. So 25 years of type 2 diabetes, and we literally reversed them within a month, a month and a half. It was ridiculous how quickly they got better. And even now, we still follow them, and they're still sort of not back on medications. They're still doing really well. So it is a disease that is amenable, is reversible. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're doing it well and you have the information that you need to work with your doctor to get better. So there's no reason why you couldn't do this. Thank you, Jason. Megan, what are your, from Alejandro, what are your thoughts on using electrolyte supplements that have stevia or monk fruit in them? Ah, <laughs> this is a question I am asked a, a lot. Um, if taking stevia and monk fruit doesn't interfere with your fast in the sense that it doesn't make you hungry, it doesn't make you crave sweet foods, you don't see a blood, your blood sugar levels go up, and you're just still getting the results that you want. If you're tracking biomarkers like your hemoglobin A1C, that it's coming down. If your waist circumference is coming down and you're happy with your results, then by all means, uh, you can continue using them. But we do find that it's often problematic. People find that they really cause their appetite to increase. They struggle a lot more with their fast. It's more painful for them to suffer through. They're not seeing the results that they want in terms of their blood tests and their waistline. So often people do choose to cut them out or just limit them to their eating days in their eating windows at mealtimes. Perfect. 
Dr. Fung, um, Jackie says, we are so inspirational. That is so true, Jackie, so are you. Uh, is it common if you're a novice faster that your blood sugar levels will be higher than normal? If so, about how long will it take, take to see those levels decrease? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so everybody, uh, you know, thinks that your blood sugar should fall during fasting because if you're not eating, then your blood sugar should go down. And in most cases, it does. In a few certain cases, it actually goes up, which is very interesting. And the reason is that when you fast, your insulin goes down, but certain other hormones go up. Included in that is something called the sympathetic nervous system, which includes noradrenaline, for example, and cortisol and growth hormones. So those are hormones that will go up during fasting. And the goal of those hormones is to push sugar from the stored form into the blood. So this is because you're not eating, the body still needs energy, so therefore it increases these hormones to push glucose into the blood. If you have sort of too much glucose stored in your body, it could be a little bit over exuberant and push too much glucose into the blood. This is how blood sugar normally stays stable when you eat or don't eat. So remember, if you're not eating, if uh, insulin is falling, your, your blood sugar shouldn't go down below a certain level, otherwise we'd all get seizures. So that's why how the body sort of maintains that. So because you're not eating, the glucose, if it just kept going into the cells, would go too low, so your body actually increases uh, the sympathetic nervous system, which is a form of activation of the body. And so also one of the reasons we don't see as much of a decrease in the basal metabolic rate, and that's why we see the increase People find that they can concentrate better. People find that they have more energy because remember the body is not shutting down during fasting. It's actually activating during fasting. And that's why, because the body is trying to push the sugar up. So essentially it means that you have sort of a little bit too much sugar and it's kind of pushing it too much into the system. So it's not they're dangerous. It's just something that does happen every so often. And it's part of the normal process. How long does it take to go away? Nobody can really answer that. It sort of uh, depends on what happens. Usually within um, a few, you know, if you do it a few times, people will notice that their blood glucose doesn't go up as much, but it could last a long time because if, you're, if you have too much glucose, then the body is just going to push it out more. Just like if you have a balloon that's overinflated, as soon as you release it, it's just going to push out a lot of air. Same thing, if you're storing a lot of sugar in your body, and you now give the signal that you can start moving that glucose back into the blood because you're not eating, then it may push too much out. It's the same thing. So once you deflate that balloon, it's going to go back to a normal level. Same thing with your glucose. Once you start fasting on a regular basis, you'll find that the blood glucose doesn't go nearly up as nearly as much. It should really just stay stable. Got it. Megan, is it better to consume Himalayan salt or can I benefit just from drinking mineral water during a fast? That's really different for everybody. So many people do just fine on a fast drinking water or having tea and coffee periodically with some broth. Some people though find that they definitely need the salt to keep them feeling well during a fast. So you can get your salt through broth if you prefer to do it that way. You could, a lot of people in our community love drinking sugar-free pickle juice. That seems to be the trend right now uh, to change things up. Or you could use a good quality salt like Himalayan salt or Celtic salt are great quality salts. You could add to water or just put a pinch on your tongue if you need a boost on a fasting day. We have some questions now and a few of them about um, exercise. So Megan, do you want to talk about how does fasting affect exercise? Can I exercise while fasting? Should it be aerobic or anaerobic or their preferences around that? <laughs> A lot of people ask, and if you're feeling well during your fasting day, I don't see why you can't go and, and have a great workout. Uh, you should really just pay attention to how, how you're feeling. If you're not feeling the best, then maybe you stick to a walk or some lower intensity uh, exercises like yoga or Pilates. I actually have had the best weightlifting session of my life, 96 hours fasted. And my trainer, who was a non-believer in fasting after that session, has started doing regular 18-hour fasts herself uh, because she was so inspired by the change in me that day. I think what um, makes people uh, succeed at 
exercising on a fasting state is just making sure that they're properly hydrated. So, you know, taking a couple of pinches of salt and water about an hour before you work out or having a cup of bone broth or a low carb based veggie broth an hour before you work out and then doing so again after your exercise seems to help a lot of people feel good and it doesn't cause a spike in their appetite once they're done their workout. Got it. Dr. Fung, Andrea says, do you recommend fasting in teenagers? I read some of your books and some videos on YouTube, but I never heard about how fasting affects teenagers and if it is recommended. I'm 16 and overweight and making water fasting 48 to 72 hours. There's no reason why teenagers uh, shouldn't fast. However, uh, it is a period of growth. So you just need to make sure that you're getting adequate nutrition. So in general, I recommend that you wait till you're sort of 18 and then you can do sort of over 24 hours just because of this concern that you're not going to get enough nutrition. Remember in the 1970s, there's a huge, huge problem with anorexia nervosa. Uh, obviously, that's much different now than it was then, but that show, just shows you what can happen uh, in sort of severe cases of people not eating. So you try to avoid that because remember, it's a period that you need to maximize your growth. That's when people grow. Once you hit 18, 19, most people are not growing anymore. So therefore, it's, the maintenance is much easier than trying to grow taller, grow bigger, and that kind of thing. So up to about 24 hours is not a problem. Uh, above that, you should really talk to your doctor, make sure that they're monitoring your growth, making sure that you're not getting uh, malnourished. Like if you're overweight, then obviously it's, it's probably not a big issue, but you know there are people who are overweight and still not getting adequate nutrition. And we wanna make sure that people do get the enough amino acids, enough protein, enough uh, vitamins, that kind of thing. So certainly I would, um, you know, I, again, you have to, in, your, in people's own specific cases, you have to talk to your doctor. There's no reason why people couldn't do it. But in general, if I had to give general advice for everybody, I generally say stick to sort of shorter fast, make sure when you eat, you eat really good quality, unprocessed food. And that's probably more important than, than cutting out the snacks, cutting out the sugar, cutting out some of the processed and junk foods. That's probably more important than fasting in terms of trying to maintain a healthy weight. Got it. Megan, can fasting reverse my psoriasis? So we've worked with a couple of patients that have had psoriasis and, and fasting can definitely help lower inflammation. So I wouldn't say there's no data, I think, to support that fasting can reverse psoriasis, but we, there is data that demonstrates that fasting is effective at reducing inflammation. And we've seen some of the people that we've worked with benefit from that inflammation reduction who struggle with psoriasis. Dr. Fung, blood glucose levels, how low is too low? Um, there's a normal range. So in Canada, we use millimoles per liter. And normal is like four to six and anything below that is abnormal. So even if, assuming you're not on medication, your blood glucose should not really fall below that. So even if you're fasting for, and so for example, one fellow who has written up uh, as the world record holder for fasting, he fasted for something like 380 two days and his blood glucose did fall below the normal range, but stayed there. So it shouldn't go much below four uh, because your body is supposed to generate its own glucose. That is, it breaks down fat and produces some glucose in your brain. Most of your tissues are going to be metabolizing fat, so they're not using glucose and most of your brain is going to metabolize uh, using ketones and again, sort of saving the glucose um, in the body and maintaining a normal level. So if you're falling below the normal, again, depending on your units and your lab, um, then yeah, you should really think, is there something else going on? So for example, if you're on medications, it's probably the most uh, common reason that we see uh, for people's blood glucose falling below normal. But yeah, even during fasting, it should not go outside the normal range. Dr. Fung, does the fastingmethod.com give online courses for medical doctors as I would like to start it in my practice? Yeah, so the fastingmethod.com is a great resource for everybody. So 
we have uh, not only beginner courses, which is so we have three levels of courses. And the beginner level, of course, is really for everybody, you know, who is just starting or just wanting to refresh. And it talks about sort of all the basics, all the not just the sort of science of it, but also the practical aspects of it. Um, and then also includes a lot of handouts for people to refer to for quick reference, for example, and not only covers the fasting, but also sort of what we approach as a good uh, diet, like, uh, you know, that you shouldn't be afraid of natural fats and uh, that kind of thing. And also a community of supportive people, because sort of one of the things that you have to understand is that any sort of dietary change is difficult and everything is easier when you're doing it with people who will support you. That's the whole premise of programs like Alcoholics Anonymous or Weight Watchers. It's not the program that's specifically, it's not the knowledge, but it's that sort of group of supportive people. And that's what we aim to provide with the fastingmethod.com. If you're a healthcare professional, there's also resources. So it has, the fastingmethod.com has resources for everybody, including up to professionals. So our advanced course, in fact, is a uh, series of lectures, um, and I'm, we're still adding to it as it goes, but it's a series of lectures that I give uh, to medical professionals, like physicians, mostly physicians. So all the way up to a physician level education, there's going to be education available uh, for you as long, uh, along with resources for patients to, to, to give, you know, handouts to, and also like huge uh, eBooks, for example, we have, I don't know, I think we have like five eBooks that are available on, on the fastingmethod.com with basically everything <laughs> you would want to know and more about fasting and weight loss and obesity and diabetes. So there's a lot of stuff in there. A lot of people, maybe it's gonna be over their heads, but hey, if you're able to, if you're, it's available there for you if, if you wanna go into that really, really deep level of understanding, you know, and it doesn't, there's no upper limit to the level of uh, courses that are there. So like you could be a specialist physician and still learn stuff because these are those advanced courses or rounds that I give for specialist physicians. Someone is asking, when will the book be available in Spanish? We don't have that answer, but we do know that they're working on it. Does the book have a Kindle version? Yes, it absolutely does. Uh, does the book have an audible version? Yes, it absolutely does. It even has the CD version, which I didn't even know people <laughs> still listen to CD versions of books, but it does. Megan, does your body get used to fasting? I fast 16-8 for a few months. Should I change it up? You should probably change it up. It's a good idea to not do the same thing day in and day out. Um, so if you've been doing 16 hours of fasting every day, try throwing in a 24-hour fast. Or even if you're, if you're not feeling hungry come dinner time, extending it for the entire day and see how you feel. Dave says he loved the book. Thank you so much, Dave. He is from Ireland. He is a 40-year-old man. This is for you, Dr. Fung, on thyroid medication for an underactive thyroid. I'm a running coach who runs over 2,000 miles a year, but due to poor diet, I am in an overweight range. My energy levels dropped last May, and when bloods were done, thyroid was low. Will intermittent fasting help me get off my thyroid meds? Has there been any research done and correlation seen? Um, very indirect. So if you look at the hormones that are affected during fasting, it tends not to be thyroid so much. So it tends to be insulin. So all the diseases of too much insulin, which includes overweight, type 2 diabetes and PCOS, for example, and fatty liver. All of those diseases are caused by too much insulin. So therefore lowering insulin is going to help. Um, thyroid uh, hormone is not particularly affected by the diet, except in a very roundabout way. So we do have several patients who have noted a significant improvement in their thyroid, and it's probably because of the anti-inflammatory effect that we see. So some people who have this thing called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, very, very common. And um, if the, sometimes the fasting might help some of the inflammation there, and by decreasing the inflammation, you decrease the sort of thyroid uh, impact. But that's a bit of a sort of long way around. Um, fasting itself is not expected to have a huge impact on 
uh, your thyroid. But it does happen sometimes. Once in a while, we hear it sort of every so often that somebody feels much, much better, their thyroid feels much better. And that's, that's probably the reason, the anti-inflammatory effect. Got it. I'll take this next question from Alex. I've lost 80 pounds using fasting and kept it off for six months, but have fallen hard off the wagon, partly due to COVID-19 with my overeating impulses. Will the new book address keeping the weight off and swatting away various surprise challenges? Alex, yes, it will. This book is written specifically from an emotional and lifestyle point of view. It has the science from Jason, the research and the questions answered from Megan, and I think goal setting and getting back on track and dealing with your mind, um, I, I think a lot for me. So there is a whole chapter on getting back on track. Um, you are, I think, no exception in this circumstance. I think that we are all struggling to one extent or another right now. And I think the fact that you have lost 80 pounds is incredible and I'm so excited for you. But yes, there's techniques for you to set goals for yourself and to feel better about yourself and techniques to treat yourself better in your head um, that should help with this situation that we're in now and whatever next tough situation we have in life. Also, it talks about celebrating the good times and making sure you're taking care of recognizing what you have already achieved so I can help to keep you on track. Nuria says, hello from Spain. My name is Nuria. I would like to know, Megan, I would like to know if one meal a day, OMAD, every day at the same time is okay, or will my body get used to it and not lose weight? Sorry for my English. Naria, your English was beautiful, so no apologies. Every now and then, having one meal a day at the same time every day works really well, but I find that most often it doesn't work work very well for individuals trying to lose, you know, more than you know, 15 or 20 pounds. So it's usually trying to change it up. If people like having one meal a day, then we're big advocates of alternating between 30 and 16 hours of fasting. And this might sound like a lot of fasting math. Um, so to make it not confusing, uh, you would alternate between eating lunch and dinner. So Monday you would have lunch, Tuesday you would have dinner, Wednesday you would have lunch, Thursday you would have dinner, Friday you would have lunch, Saturday you'd have dinner, and then Sunday you could mix it up. So we call this our 30-16 hour protocol. And it's a great way to still eat one meal a day, but add in that variation that can help keep the weight loss happening. Dr. Fung, is it normal to have kind of restless legs during fasting? Um, no, uh, restless legs though is very common. And for most people, it's a bit of a magnesium deficiency. So that's the most common reason we see it. So cramps in the legs and restless legs are often caused and they're common anyway. So it's not just during fasting, but we do see it uh, a lot with people who are fasting. So replacement of magnesium is often beneficial here. And this is where it gets a little tricky. So you can take magnesium uh, in terms of foods, but there's relatively few foods uh, that are very, very high in magnesium. There are a few, but then uh, there are magnesium supplements, uh, which are not always well absorbed. So some of the magnesium supplements tend to give diarrhea, which is why that they're used very often as laxatives. So if you look at two very common laxatives like milk of magnesia, which is a very traditional uh, laxative, and citromag, which is a magnesium citrate, uh, they're both uh, described as medications as laxatives because of their effect, which limits the total amount of magnesium that you can absorb just by taking oral magnesium pills. So if you look at magnesium supplements, there's magnesium oxide, there's magnesium, and that tends to be the cheapest one, but it also tends to be the worst one. And you can get other ones like magnesium glycinate and uh, magnesium rougier, and so there's different other ones that are slightly better. And then the other way is to absorb the magnesium through the skin, which is uh, done by using Epsom salts, which is uh, magnesium sulfate salt, which you can put in the bath, like a cup of magnesium uh, sulfate in the bath or Epsom salt in the bath, and soak in it for about half an hour. And again, a very, very traditional sort of uh, treatment, if you think about people who go to these mineral baths and dead sea salt and go to the dead sea and stuff to help their joints and help their whatever. It's basically a very high magnesium concentration. They absorb this through the skin and then they feel better. 
And that's a very traditional way to get the magnesium as well. If you don't like taking a bath, which is very common, you can get magnesium oil, which is also magnesium sulfate, uh, and you just spray it on and let it absorb. That way you don't have to sit in the bath for half an hour, which some people don't like to do. So magnesium is the key there. And then there's pickle juice, which some people find very helpful for that uh, as well. Got it. Is it possible to schedule a consultation with Megan or Dr. Fung? I'm going to answer this and you guys tell me if I get this right. Um, Dr. Fung is super sweet to join us today because he is actually treating patients uh, currently and, and we're super happy to have him with us today. And Megan and Jason have been in such um, high demand for people to talk to that they have actually started uh, coaching with a group of coaches that they have trained and certified themselves at thefastingmethod.com. So different people need different levels of support with fasting. Some can just read some stuff and do it on their own and don't need a thing. And I, who am a bit more high maintenance, uh, need a coach to talk to. So you can check out thefastingmethod.com and there are all different types of coaches that you can look at there who you might feel comfortable with or match your situation. And that's where you can get information about one-on-one -on -one coaching. Anything to add to that, Megan or Jason? We have a self-guided program that has a lot of education. So the courses that Jason mentioned earlier, a lot of resources like people's most frequently asked questions about fasting and eating. Jason and I answer the top 50. We have a lot of great handouts, guides, and eBooks. Um, we have focus groups where people can interact live with myself and our other coaches. And um, we have all different types of community um, resources, including a great forum. Every week we run a new group fasting challenge. So we have this, this community that people can subscribe to on a month by month basis or purchase an annual membership to as well if they don't have the resources to work with a fasting coach. Fantastic. Thank you, Megan. So somebody has asked, can you tell us each a little bit about your fasting protocol? I'm going to go first because mine will be the least impressive. Um, I have done a three-day fast, a 10-day fast, and an 11-day fast. Those have been my longest fast over my two-year fasting um, time that, that I have done. Most of the time I eat at noon, three and six. I have a surgically altered stomach, so sometimes I can't get quite enough food to just stick to two meals. Sometimes I can, so usually noon, three and six. And then on Sundays, I get lucky and I eat three meals. Megan, how about you? Um, I'm trying to take advantage of doing more chores around the house now that we're home <laughs> with COVID. So I'm doing a couple 24 hours a week and I do a 16 hour fast. Uh, daily. This week in our community, we're trying to end our fast a little bit earlier on in the day. So my last eating window is from about one to two o'clock. And that gives me more time to do more things for me in the evening, which I really appreciate. When I was trying to reverse my diabetes and all those metabolic conditions and lose all that weight, I did on average two 42 hour fasts a week and one 24. I chose to do the 24 hour fast on Fridays just so I could enjoy Friday evening with friends or family over, over a meal and celebrate the end of the work week. Jason, how about you? So my usual schedule um, is 16 hours. I, I rarely eat breakfast. Um, mostly, you know, I, this is a holdover from, from sort of college when I didn't want to get up and I just roll out of bed, <laughs> sort of go into work and I'd rather not eat breakfast. So I, I hadn't really gotten ever into the habit of eating breakfast just because I, you know, I was busy and I was tired and I'd rather sleep. So it was very easy for me to do those 16 hour fasts because that, you know, if you go right to lunch, it's, that's it. And then normally I do 24 hours, two times a week or more, uh, depending on how busy I am. So again, it varies a little bit. If I'm really busy, then I'll do more fasting so that I have more time to do other stuff. And then I typically do a couple of longer fasts. Uh, and the way I usually work them in is after like holidays. So after Christmas, so during Christmas, for example, I will not be doing any sort of <laughs> dieting or fasting specifically. I'll still mostly skip breakfast, but that's not for any specific reason. But I, you know, I basically just enjoy myself and I permit myself to eat whatever and do whatever for that 
sort of few days uh, over Christmas. Um, and then after Christmas, I'll usually do like a longer fast, typically like between three and five days. And then I, I plan to do it after holidays as well. So again, when I go on vacation, I typically do not follow any standard diet. I try and just enjoy myself and eat, you know, go with the program. So if I'm, you know, if I'm, you know, having ice cream with the kids, then I'll have ice cream, right? Not healthy for you or anything, but I, you know, that's not, that's a choice I make. But then when I get back, I usually do a longer fast. So again, between sort of three and five days. And what I find, of course, is that it varies depending on what my specific needs are. That is, by the time I'm finished holidays or the time I'm finished, um, you know, a week and a week and a bit of vacation, my pants are starting to get a little tight. And so after three or five days of fasting, I, I can feel it, the, the, the pants start to fit normally again, and I start to look normal again, and I don't feel so bloated as I usually do. But, but see, that's what I mean when I say you have to sort of take your specific goals so that I do that, of course, so that I don't really have to be as careful during my vacation. Now, keeping in mind that I'm in a different situation too, as in I don't, I just want to maintain my weight. I'm not looking to lose weight. So obviously I give myself the sort of liberty to eat sort of uh, whatever I feel like during that period of, you know, maybe two or three times a year, I'll say, okay, I'll eat whatever. Although typically I still, you know, once, once you get used to not eating too sweet of stuff, you really can't eat. Like sometimes my kids, they get these sugary stuff. I'm like, holy, how can you drink this stuff? It's like <laughs> killing me. It's so sweet. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, you know, I don't drink a lot of sugar. So therefore it feels very sweet. So that's, that's sort of how I do it. Um, and, and really, you really have to discover what works for you the best. The longer fast, I actually find um, quite nice. Exactly. They're, 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 they're not as hard. Once you set yourself that goal ahead of time, I find that it's actually not as difficult as most people feel they are. And the benefits to me are that I get back on track very, very quickly once I sort of sort of fall off the wagon. I mean, it's a deliberate sort of falling off the wagon, but it is. It's a falling off the wagon for a week, but I have that planned already. So it, it makes it easy. My family knows to expect me not to be eating dinner with them and that kind of thing. So Jason and Megan, thank you so much. I'm going to answer one more question. I know we did not get to everyone's questions. I know we tried to as much as possible. I think you can find a lot of these answers or send your questions to thefastingmethod.com where you can reach Megan and Jason and also hang out with me at fastinglane.com. The last question is, how does the newest book, Life in the Fasting Lane, differ from the other books? So I'm going to talk about this as like an outside reader, and then maybe Jason and Megan can add on if I miss anything. Ob the obesity code really changed my life. It explained the science and the things that doctors never explained to me about insulin resistance and how the body worked and how hormones worked. And I don't know why I never asked those questions before, but it taught me the things I needed to know to be curious enough about my health. However, Jason is really smart, and sometimes I was a little bit confused, and I had to read slowly to absorb it all. The book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, is a really good book, easier for me to understand, and has such a variety of stories from so many different types of people about how they did it, and I thought that was like a really nice guide, and that was written with Dr. Fung and Jimmy Moore. A book I found particularly helpful for my mom with diabetes type 2 was The Diabetes Code by Dr. Jason Fung, which is great specifically for people who have type 2 diabetes. Life in the Fasting Lane is a very specific book. It's not for people who are mostly looking for the answers around the science, although there is some light science in it from Jason. We wanted to create a book that was unique in the fact that it had these three viewpoints, a real person who had struggled, uh, a researcher who had treated thousands of patients and a doctor who had the medical and science background. So I would say what makes this book different is it's written from the lifestyle and emotional side. If you have ever felt broken or you have ever felt shame or you have ever felt frustration at being overweight, 
and really wanted to dive into how you overcome that in your mind as well as your body, then I think this is the book to possibly consider. Jason, Megan, anything to add on to that? I think that's a great summary, Eve. Um, it's a book that I hope that everybody in our fasting community reads because there's so many people that have tried all these other diets, but there's all these, they're all calorie restriction based, just with different packaging. And they don't work. We know they don't work. We know the data is there to show that they don't work. So there are a lot of people out there that feeling like they failed and that their bodies are broken and that you know other people are getting can get success but not them. But that's not true. And all of the things, Eve, you're so willing and, and vulnerable to share. These are things I hear from people all of the time that are scared that it's just them. But I hope that this book makes them realize that it's not just them and that there is hope that they can get control of their health. They can get control of their waistline. They could be a success story too. At the top. Thanks to all of you who joined us from all over. And thank you to our panelists. And please be safe during this COVID-19. We're all together in this. We're all thinking. Thank you. Take care.